Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello folks and welcome to another episode of Stories, a history of Appalachia. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins, and today Rod and I are going to tell you about Edith Wilson. You know, we may very well have had our first woman president, not elected by the people, Mm -hmm. but she could have very well been our first woman president of the United States. Absolutely. And, And why are we talking about Edith Bowling? Well, it just so happens that she was born in Appalachia, specifically in Withville, Virginia, to Circuit Court Judge William Holcomb Bowling and his wife, Sarah Spears on October 15th, 1872. Another interesting fact about Mrs. Wilson is that she was a descendant of a very famous person in colonial Virginia. And that person was whom? Pocahontas. Mm -hmm. Her husband, John Rolfe, one of the earliest English settlers in Virginia and the first man to do what, Steve? Uh, The first man to grow tobacco in the Virginia colony. That's right. It's an export crop. But what is also a coincidence in this, too, uh, she, was of, uh, she was the seventh of 11 children. Two of them had died in infancy, but the Bowlings claimed to have a, well, a connection to the American Civil War. Most were forced to give up their plantation home after being unable to pay taxes on the land following the end of the war. Uh, William Bowling settled on his father's property in Withful, where most of his children were born, and they were also staunch supporters of the Confederate States of America, with Edith being very proud of her Southern heritage. Yes, indeed. And as as was often the case with slaves freed after the war, well, the Bowlings at the time of the Civil War believed their former slaves were content with life on their plantation called Rose Cottage Plantation and had little desire for freedom. Uh, they found out differently, of course, after the Civil War. And because they lost their property, because of all the trauma of the Civil War, William Bowling turned to the practice of law and then went on to become a circuit court judge. Now, as far as the rest of this goes, Edith Bowling is more known as the second wife of Woodrow Wilson, who was president of the United States and also born in Virginia. So we actually had a Southern couple in the White House back in the teens. Now, and we've also got to mention, too, that, you know, we've mentioned the Appalachian connection here, but there are some other coincidences that kind of jump out at you about Edith Bowling Wilson. When she was 15, she enrolled in college at Martha Washington College, Mm -hmm. which was a precursor to Emory and Henry College. She also went to a finishing school for girls in Abingdon, Virginia. Now, she had a little formal education more than anything else, but a lot of the things she learned, her father would either read English literature to her and would read to the family at night. He also hired a tutor on to help her out when she went to school. But when uh, things kind of changed after that, after she finished up with school and the music program and so forth, she returned home after a single semester. She was 17. Her father then enrolled in Powell's School for Girls in Richmond, Virginia. And that's when she said she had the happiest time of her life because some of the schools that she attended, they were largely cold rooms. They were served poor food, and she was miserable there, at least at the finishing school in Abingdon, Virginia. But uh, Power School closed at the end of the year after the headmaster suffered an accident that ended up costing him his leg. And then, concerned about the cost of her education, William Bowling refused to pay for any additional schooling for her, choosing to send her three brothers to school instead, which was a, a typical thing in the Appalachians back in those times. The reason being is because the, the males were the ones that were expected to be the breadwinner out of the family, and they were the ones that were sent on for school, if that was the case, to go on and further their careers while the women returned back to doing what, Steve? Well, they went home to take care of babies. That's right. Either the mother was still having babies at that time or were setting themselves up to become wives themselves and have babies a little bit later on. She had married a gentleman by the name of Norman Galt, who died in 1908, who was a prominent jeweler. But then after he passed away, She was introduced to U.S. President Woodrow Wilson at the White House by Helen Woodrow Bones, the president's first cousin and official White House hostess since the death of Ellen Wilson, the president's first wife. 
Wilson took an almost immediate liking to Mrs. Galt, or Edith Bowling as we know her, and his admiration grew swiftly into love, and then he later proposed to her. Rumor said that Wilson had been cheating on his first wife, and that Mrs. Galt had actually murdered the first lady. Mm -mm -mm. All these Uh, rumors up in Washington, I can't believe that. I can't believe that either. (laughs) That's just so dirty and heinous of these people to even think things like that. But anyway, distressed at all the effect that this might be having on his fiance, Wilson offered her the opportunity to back out of the engagement, but she said that she would not uh, she would stand by him not for duty, pity uh, or honor, but for love. So they ended up getting married on December 18th, 1915 at her home in Washington D.C. It was attended by 40 guests, and the couple honeymooned for two weeks in Hot Springs, Virginia, and they honeymooned at the Greenbrier in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. But as World War I started progressing on, things started happening, and Woodrow Wilson ended up, well, about the best way we can say this is Woodrow Wilson suffered a stroke while he was in the office of President of the United States. World War I was just so stressful. For the president, and it really was, and, and yeah. he had enemies abroad, enemies at home. He was trying to get the League of Nations. That was his big passion in life mm-hmm. to get the League of Nations started, and that was falling apart. Um, he negotiated the Treaty of Versailles, but the Senate wouldn't ratify it, mm-hmm. and all this, as you said, caused him to have a stroke, which left him partially paralyzed. And some say that he wasn't able to actually run the White House and the country that it was mrs wilson that was doing that that's exactly right there are a lot of people that believe that she took over many of the routine duties and details of the executive branch of the government and in a time of where there was very little communication except for uh, by probably telephone a little bit of telephone at that time but you didn't have the uh internet you did not have the uh super uh, wire services to be able to report all this information, we could say that the president was sort of, how can we say it, Steve, isolated to a certain degree? Yeah, she would not let anybody go in and talk to him. They would have to come to her, tell her what they wanted from the president. She would then go talk to him and then come out and tell them what his decision was. She said it was just to keep the stress down on him of all those decisions, although as Washington is wont to do, they rumors spread that she was actually the one making those decisions. They called her the presidentress. That's what yes. one Republican senator labeled her. In her own memoir, she called herself the steward of the president and insisted her actions had been taken only because the president's doctors told her to do so for her husband's mental health. Yeah, and there are historians that go and take issue with her version of events, such as a journalist, Phyllis Lee Levin, who wrote that Edith Wilson was a woman of narrow views and formidable determination. But to me, I would think she was a woman who was very protective of her husband, and that's what she was, because she was trying to go and keep him from you know, being exposed as being incompetent to be the president of the United States. As a matter of fact, we said that he was paralyzed on his left side. A lot of the things that happened with the with paralysis on the left side from a stroke happened to be things of having to do with memory having to do with rationality and those were some of the things that wilson just could not accomplish at that time and it could also be that she didn't want people to see him if he were not in total control and who else was like this too later on a president but it wasn't the fact of the female or the wife like this it was the person themselves and the handlers it was franklin roosevelt Mm -hmm. that's right because there were a lot of people that did not know that franklin roosevelt had suffered polio but in 1921 she retired with the former president to their home in washington dc she nursed him there until uh his death three years later she later served as a director of the woodrow wilson foundation when roosevelt who we were talking about went to congress on december 8 1941 to ask for a declaration of war he took pains to draw a symbolic link with the april 1917 declaration of war mrs wilson accompanied him because we were a pacifist nation at that time during World War I yeah. until we finally got involved in the, what, latter year, two years, right before the war ended, something like that. 1917. So, 
Yeah, so it was, you know, we got involved in the latter stages of that. She attended the inauguration of President John F. Kennedy, but she died of congestive heart failure at the age of 89 on December 28, 1961. She was supposed to have been a guest of honor at the dedication ceremony for the Woodrow Wilson Bridge across the Potomac in what would have been her husband's 105th birthday, and she was later buried next to the president at the Washington Cathedral, and she left her home for the National Trust for Historic Preservation What's interesting to note, Steve, is that now exists an Edith Bowling Wilson birthplace, uh, and also they have a foundation set up in Withful. That was established back in 2008. It's uh, managed to stabilize the First Lady's birthplace, which was named by the Preservation Virginia as an endangered historic site in May of 2013. So now when you go to Withful or you're coming up Interstate 81 or going south on Interstate 81, there are uh, mentions now in uh, paperwork or in brochures about Edith Wilson uh, and her birthplace being in the town of Withful. So it's it's bound to become a uh, uh, an even more popular place if we do actually have a female elected as president of the United States. But I'm here to tell you in this podcast, we've pretty much had one. She just wasn't elected by the people at that time, but she served as a president and was able to do a lot of things for the United States during a time of such upheaval. The story of Edith Wilson. Uh, That's another story in the history of Appalachia. And we appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, you can do so by going to iTunes or to Stitcher or to your favorite Android or Windows Phone podcast app. We're also on Facebook. Please come by and like us. And we're on Twitter at Story Appalachia. So until next time, take care and we'll see you then. So long, everybody. 